Good evening, everyone. I'm Iris Bonnet. I'm the academic dean of the Harvey Kennedy School and also the director of the Women in Public Policy program. I am delighted to welcome all of you to our forum event tonight, where we will have a discussion and a screening of a very important film series on women, war, and peace produced by Abigail Disney. The film is in fact going to be screened on PBS starting next Tuesday evening. So please do mark your calendars. Next Tuesday evening, that is October the 11th at 10 p.m. And that is going to be the first film of a series of five, who, which will be screened every Tuesday evening at 10 p.m. until November 8th. I am particularly pleased that Abigail is able to join us here tonight um, to share some of the insights on how she produced the film, how she came about um, to working on this film series. Abigail is a leader on human rights, on conflict prevention, and on women's economic empowerment, and empowerment more generally, really, across the world. She's received numerous awards um, for her work on women's leadership and conflict resolution, including the Epic Award from the White House Project, the Changing the Landscape for Women Award from the Center for the Advancement of Women, and the prestigious International Advocate for Peace Award from the Cardozo Journal of Conflict Resolution. In addition to this, Abby has a long-standing relationship with the Harvey Kennedy School, and in particular has been a friend and supporter of the Women in Public Policy Program. This event tonight is brought to us by the Carr Center for Human Rights here at the Kennedy School, as well as the Institute for Politics and the Women in Public Policy Program. And I am particularly grateful for all of those who have made this event possible tonight. With that, I would like to introduce our moderator of tonight, Sahana Dharmapuri. Sahana is an independent gender advisor with experience providing policy research, writing, and training services on gender, peace, and security issues to USAID, NATO, UNIFEM, international development consulting firms, NGOs, and many, many more organizations across the world. Currently, we're delighted to have her here at the Kennedy School as a fellow at our Carr Center for Human Rights. Sahana, thank you very much for bringing this incredible panel to us and the film to us, and um, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Iris, and I'm really delighted to be here tonight to discuss the topic of women, war, and peace with our panel of experts. Um, this topic could not be more timely, actually. I don't know if many of you know, but last year, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announced the development of a US national action plan to implement Security Council Resolution 1325 on women, peace, and security. And so this evening, we're going to have an opportunity to talk about many of the themes in that resolution that will be coming forward in the National Action Plan for the US. So tonight, um, we're going to be focusing on women's involvement in international peace and security, the role that they play, the challenges they face, and the contributions that they make. And I thought we'd start the discussion by actually asking Abby, before we see the film, what inspired you to do the film in the first place? Well, um, as with any birth myth, it's complicated. It involves more than one person. Um, in terms of my development around this, I, uh, I wrote a dissertation many, many years ago at Columbia um, for an, a PhD in English on um, war novels, American war novels. and. Um, I was very struck by the absence of women from those landscapes. I was so st struck by the counterintuitiveness of that lack. You know, why were they so invisible? If Attila the Hun can rape and pillage his way across Europe, and sur surely there were women there somewhere at some time, if you can house to house fight through a town, where did these people go? They, did, they didn't melt into thin air. What, where are they? Um, and so that kind of stayed with me for a long time. And what also stayed with me was this imagery that goes well be beyond the American novel, um, you know, to the Iliad, uh, of heroism, of masculinity, 
of the way that operates as a kind of a driver around conflict. So that all stayed with me for many years. I went on to do a lot of philanthropic work and work around women's leadership. And lo and behold, years later, and it's all Swanee Hunt's fault, I found myself in Liberia. And while I was in Liberia, meeting President Sirleaf and listening and watching Swanee's work there, I, um, I heard this story. <laughs> and it was the most amazing story. And you know, I'm not going to bore you with it, but basically, it was such a heroic, amazing, historical, with a capital H, authoritative, with a capital A, story um, that just it made me you know, deeply angry, really, that I didn't already know it. Um, I read the papers. I pay attention. I'm pretty well informed. I didn't know this story. Um, it really did occur to me that this is what it looks like, just as you're erased from the story. And we all know from our women's history that that's the persistent story of women's lives, that they, they kind of surface, they write a novel, they involve themselves in politics or government, they fight for peace, and then they're disappeared from the record, the official record. And I thought, I'm picking this up in fragments and pieces. This must be what it looks like. So that was kind of my progress to making Pray the Devil Back to Hell. In that process, I re-met an old friend who had been making films about women for years. She connected me with um, her colleague who was working at WNET. And it turns out that all three of us, Pamela Hogan, Jeannie Redeker, and I, independently, kind of like a braid, <laughs> um, were thinking in our own ways about a lot of these very same questions. Where are the women? Why don't we tell these stories? How is it possible that we're this invisible in a landscape that we have to exist in. And so it was that conversation that we started in the process of making Pray the Devil Back to Hell that led inevitably to, but there's this enormous cross-cultural global connection of women around these issues. It's never been told. It's never been looked at in a sustained and rigorous and thoughtful journalistic way. And maybe we could fill that hole. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I have a question for actually all of the panelists in framing the issue of women, war, and peace. We know that there's probably 30 active conflicts globally today. We also know that 50% of peace agreements actually fail after they're signed. And we also know that there's only 3% of peace agreements that actually have women signatories on these. Um, so how does telling women's war stories actually help us develop better policy for peace and stability. And it would be particularly interesting to hear from each of your experiences. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Elizabeth Medina is a National Security Fellow with us here at the Kennedy School. Hel Helen Benedict is a professor at the Columbia School of Journalism and the author of two books on women in the military. I think you know, it would be very interesting to hear about um, how these stories of women affect the way we think about policy. Okay. Well, from the military perspective, one of the things that happens when you start talking about these issues and start seeing them and living them and feeling that they're real and how they're real and to whom is, then you start to be able to identify things that will really work. I know uh, we learn lessons, you know, lessons learned is a term in the military, but oftentimes we learn lessons after we've already hit the ground. And it's much better, more effective if you've already thought through some of these things and come to a conclusion as to what the goal will be, how you're going to implement a program, and who will implement the program well in advance of actually getting your feet on the ground. We had in any number of countries that we've been in, of course, we've learned lessons, but I'll just use the example of Iraq because I think we'll be able to talk about it. In Iraq, we, we learned lessons of you know, how are women integrated already. I mean, we weren't going into that conflict with those thoughts. We were going into the conflict as a military force, mostly with you know, we have a goal to achieve, the reconstruction will come, but we hadn't considered the, the, gender, um, the gender issues. Smart people were there and involved, and so things started to happen like the, the business center was inclusive of women, women wanted to be involved, and it's ebbed and flowed through the, uh, the years that we've been there. But Iraq is different. It's not going to necessarily be that way if you hit, um, hit the ground in a country where you know, women haven't been included. So that's one 
perspective. Um, I'm very interested in your thesis because I've been thinking about this same subject about where are women's voices in war stories, especially given how often women are affected or if not actually killed in wars. And you've got an amazing statistic in the film about what 90% of casualties in wars are civilians and 75% are of those are women and children. Um, <clears throat> given how much women are affected by wars and how uh, rarely they actually get to say any say in the wars and, or, or get to fight back in wars, I think it's essential that we listen to them. And talking about war stories from the point of view of, of who writes them in the West and say the traditional in American literature, I mean, my problem with a lot of the way, <coughs> a lot of men's war stories is, especially when written by soldiers actually, or former soldiers, is the glamorizing of war and um, the kind of <clears throat> glorification of war, which goes back to before we could even write with you know, the old ballads, and then you look at Homer, and you look at Virgil. And so it goes on and on and on. And I think women tell a different kind of war story. Women soldiers tell a different kind, and women civilians do. And they bring a different perspective to war, which I think throws into question really important issues, such as do we torture? How do we treat civilians? Mm -hmm. Um, what, what are our rules of engagement? Why are we not sticking to them? Is there such a thing as honor in war anymore? What do we do with the fact that, there, that wars aren't army against army anymore? They are, they're all guerrilla wars one way or the other. What do we do with the fact that we have women in our military who are abused and raped and harassed at incredibly high rates by their own comrades? If we treat our own women like that, how are we going to be treating the civilians in occupied countries? Mm -hmm. That's why it's very important for women to be speaking out about these issues. Yeah, I think that you raised some really <coughs> um, important points, particularly thinking about the realities on the ground and what are the challenges that women face in decision-making roles, whether they're in reconstruction projects or they're actually carrying out military roles or they're involved in civil society operations or organizations to advance peacemaking. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges that women face in actually being able to be included um, in some of the decision-making processes. I can imagine that reconstruction project, it's really important to have more than 50% of the population considered and how they'll be treated in infrastructure rebuilding, but how do they actually get included? Well, it's different in every, at least from, from the military's perspective, and I'm commenting from, from my own background, but from our perspective, every place we go is different, and so uh, the culture is different, the women are different, the rules, the lifestyles are different, so you're starting from, from scratch anytime you're, you know, you're newly on the ground, and so the first piece of what we do is really assessing the environment and seeing, you know, where is it that we are? Where is it that this, um, that this culture is and what could be best? And starting the dialogues and the, sometimes the dialogue is difficult and sometimes uh, people don't want to open up to the military so it's then even more difficult to, to understand how the inclusion can occur if it's not already occurring. I know the military has used female engagement teams and it's still so new, I don't think we really know how effective or how uh, long-term this will be. It's a tool. There are also um, the provincial reconstruction teams. That's something that's really sprung up over the last 10 years. We really didn't have that organization, so that's really meant to go out and, and connect with the people to be able to say, you know, what is important to you? What's, what do we have uh, to offer? I'm from the development side, the development side of the military. So, you know, that's my bent as well. Um, Two-thirds of the military are basically not the combat force that most people think of, although we all have to be trained as soldiers. So, um, my perspective is a little different. I am supposed to go out and talk to people and figure out uh, what's, what's happening and how to build a relationship so that then the, um, the international community can step back in when security is reestablished and really 
take the long term you know, I think, I think one, of, one of the issues around bringing women into peace processes is the idea that we're thinking of that as something they need to be brought into um, that they're not already a part of. Because the majority of peace processes or, or the meetings that take place um, are meetings you shoot your way into. You know? and, the, and the primary issue at hand is everybody needs to stop shooting. And that is a very reasonable and important and immediate problem that needs solving. Um, but you know, it was Winston Churchill who said, you know, people who make war well rarely make peace well. Mm -hmm. And it is true that the people who have shot their way into the room really understand making currency of themselves in pretty much one kind of a way. And so if all you do in the peace agreement is, is to get everybody to put their guns down divide up the finance ministry, divide up the ministries, and go on your merry way, what you've essentially done is press a pause button on a conflict. This is not the same as building and creating a peace. So it, it is almost universally now understood in, for instance, family therapy, that you don't know anything about marriage if all you study is divorce. And likewise, we don't know anything about peace if all we understand is war or how to stop the shooting or start the shooting or mitigate the shooting. So what we know and understand about the way women operate, both through times of conflict and as well as afterwards, is that they function at the centers of all the important social institutions. They understand what has to come first, whether it's water or roads or markets or healthcare. They know where the weapons are. They know who's corrupt and who's not. They know what systems are working and what aren't working. And so the fact is that the, the second half of the peace process never ever happens. The Dayton Accords are a classic, classic example of it. They, they stopped the shooting, they never talked about justice, they never talked about construction, about where the money would be divided up and who would decide these things and how governance would occur and how these children would be educated and where would reconciliation come from. They, and if you look at the pictures, this is a war that was defined almost totally by what occurred to women's bodies and there are no women present at any level in those agreements. So that's, so, that's a great segue, because I think we have the video oh, good. ready. So do you, do you want to say a couple words about it before we see it, or maybe after? Well, I'll, we'll talk afterwards. OK. All right. So we're ready. <coughs> Do not abuse women. We are fed up with the war. They thought that none of us would survive to tell the truth. You cannot take our land away from us. frontline discussion of force, and this is what the newspapers report on. The fighting tactics, the troops, the politics, the borders, the weapons, the armies, all of the things. That is a men's story. The backline discussion of the story is how you actually exist and live and continue on living in war. That's a women's story. And that story has never been told. Warfare is a very different proposition now in which civilians are not, quote, collateral damage, as we once called them, but really uh, very much in the center of the war zone. The ordinary civilians are the ones who feel the brunt from the hunger, they watch their children die, the women are the ones rape, and then after conflict, when the wars have, have, or the end of the wars are being negotiated, they are never considered. Women says, stop violence! Stop violence! Stop violence! 
I think it's way past time that we redefine uh, what we mean by war because uh, there are no front lines in the wars in today's world. The fact is that in today's wars, the primary victims are women and children. Llega un grupo de hombres a mi casa. Yo me asusté mucho porque eran paramilitares. Yo les hablé muy fuerte, pero después cuando terminé de hablar, yo dije, Dios mío, ¿yo qué hice? Salí temblando del susto porque pensé que me iban a pegar un tiro. Yo estaba esperando mi segundo hijo y el susto Yo tuve mi bebé de manera prematura, entonces se me murió. Yo hasta hoy digo, ¿por qué no estoy muerta? Porque todo quien le hablaba así era hombre o mujer muerta. Y bueno, yo creo que Dios todavía me quiere vivir en este mundo para hacer muchas cosas por mí, por mi familia y por mi gente. Clemencia Carabelli is one of the leaders of her Afro-Colombian community. She found that in wartime, women could organize more freely than men. In the zona donde estoy, hay una red de mujeres afros. Cuando los paramilitares hacían control o hacen control en el territorio, los hombres no asesinados son tildados de guerrilleros. Buenos días. Entonces la mujer desarrolla un papel clave porque de alguna manera es la que se puede mover. Carabelli is a familiar face along this road, but for her, the road is filled with painful memories. Asesinaron más de 600 personas aquí en la zona y esos asesinatos ocurrieron aquí en el puente, un puente que queda aquí sobre el río Cauca, donde los paramilitares mataban a la persona y la tiraban al río. Death threats and the killing in Cauca have not ended. Fue una masacre de ocho mineros que fueron asesinados y hasta hoy no sabemos quién fue que los asesinó. The men were shot as they were leaving work at the gold mine. Para nosotros eso es como una advertencia que estaban como haciendo a nosotros. Muchos estábamos muy asustados de eso que está pasando porque eso es como casi siempre que ha pasado empiezan como en las comunidades asesinando a otra persona como para que uno se asuste y vaya. It's another deadly incident in the war for this valuable land. International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia Islamic Session. For the first time in history, an international court is hearing a case about camps set up specifically to rape women. Three Bosnian Serb defendants are accused of systematically raping Muslim women and reducing women and girls to sexual slavery. Defendants Zoran Vukovic, Radimir Kovac, and Dragoljub Konarets, petty commanders in Bosnian Serb paramilitary units, are accused of helping imprison Foch's women and children. Day one was a big deal. Of committing rape often. There was this sense of finally it's happening. All three defendants have pled not guilty. Being able to see these people led into the courtroom provided me with some sense that everything is normal in the world, that, that if these people are arrested and they are being led by the guards and 
put on trial that 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 we still function as as human beings. Witness, do you see your name? Yes. Next to your name, do you see a number? The witnesses all opted for the protection where their faces would not be seen and their names would not be used. Yes. Throughout these proceedings, you will be referred to by that number. Do you understand? Inside the courtroom, everybody could see everything. We could see the expressions, we could hear the voice intonations, but outside you can't see that at all. He forced all three of us to strip, always with this knife in his hand. He always had this knife. So this case is a case that really lacks a face. And then he said, you're now going to go naked down to the Drina River and that he would slit our throats there and throw us into the river. You can't see how young the witnesses are. You don't hear the anger in their voices. Didn't anyone try to protect you? Oh, really? They were ridiculing us, the people who were watching. Who do you think would protect us? 17 days into the trial, Witness 99 took the stand to tell the world what had happened inside of Partizan. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I wasn't ashamed. I was actually proud and full of strength. I looked him in the eye. How come he's not the one who was ashamed? I wanted to prove what I had survived and what had happened. back to the Bible, we saw what a sort did for her people, that she went inside clothes and ashes, saying, I mean it. Librarian women that love to do their hair and put on jewelry and makeup were not allowed to do any of those things. We wore plain white clothes with the hair tie. We wore the white, saying to people we were out for peace. We are determined, and nobody going to deter us. We're going to find a strategic point where Taylor gonna encounter us and give us some attention. And this is how we decided to sit at the fish market every day. Thousands of women, including ITPs, internally displaced persons, went. It was the first time in our history in Liberia where Muslim women and Christian women were coming together. We had a big banner that said, the women of Liberia want peace now. Charles Tiller said, those who think they can come out in the street to embarrass themselves, come out, I'm waiting for you. I say nobody, N-O-B-O-D-Y, nobody. We came into the street to embarrass my administration. We were not afraid. My mother was like, they will beat you people or they will kill you. And we said, well, if I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace.
No one from the women's network knows whether Karzai will invite them to the Jirga. Hasina Safi and the others meet anyway to devise a strategy. موضوعی دو می که ما زنا یعنی زنایی که در جرگه هستن یا می زنایی که اگر میرن در جرگه هستن میرن کوشش کنم که هر قدر می تانم کرزه های باید حمایت کنم قوی بس اگر ما ماز کرزه های مایت می ما شخصیت پرستی که مالم نیست کرزه های پرستی نیست کرزه های پر پنج سال هست در جمهور هست While they debate whether to support Karzai, it is unclear whether he will support them. He has promised women only 50 of the 1,600 seats at the Jirga. But Secretary Clinton pressured Karzai to get them more. With Clinton's help, 20% of the delegates will now be women. Safi is chosen to be one of the delegates. Back in Kandahar, Shaida Hussein learns that she will be a delegate as well. Her granddaughter wants to go too. What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? Hussein leaves for Kabul quickly, before word gets out that she's a delegate. In Kandahar, the Taliban are assassinating people who cooperate with the government. Attending Karzai's peace conference could bring a death sentence. very compelling look into the experience of war through women's eyes. Thank you, Thank you for doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to say a few words about it? Well, only to say, um, well, Helen was talking about um, this glamorization issue. Um, and I, I think if any of us closed our eyes right this second, we could probably imagine ourselves in conflict, you know, and we can hear the bullets and, you know, we sort of forget that unless we've actually been there, this all came from a movie. It came from a video game. It was scripted and edited and set directed and there's a movie industrial complex too and it's quite effective. Um, but we have always only seen it, you know, from John Wayne's point of view. The camera goes with John Wayne everywhere he goes. And if we just do this simple, tiny adjustment of giving the camera to a woman, you know, and just seeing it from where she stands, the first thing that happens is we start to understand combat isn't war. Combat is a subset of a larger thing. 
that war consumes everything like a horrible fire. It consumes every aspect of a culture, its economy, its work life, home life, everything. And that living through that, if we see it through that woman's eyes, is an entirely different affair than that you know, beautiful thing that Achilles and Hector engage in on the beach in Troy. And as we're talking about, and as we saw the challenges that women face in actually trying to impact the war, as you say in the film, and redefine war in the film, I think it would be really interesting to hear from Helen or Elizabeth too about the experiences that women actually face in, in reality of, of coming up against this as you've shown in, in the film as well and, and how women can make a contribution to peace and creating stability. Um, we may disagree, we'll see, but uh, I think it's very hard for anybody dressed in a soldier's uniform to make much of a contribution towards peace in the conflicts we're in now, frankly because <clears throat> you instill terror and danger. You, you, you represent danger. For example, for these female invest, uh, engagement teams in Afghanistan have put quite a lot of women in danger because they come and they talk to them and go away and don't necessarily come back. And they talk to them to look for intelligence as well as to try and um, create a connection. <clears throat> And if that town or if that village is controlled by the Taliban, or those women are then going to be questioned and regarded with suspicion because they've been talking to American soldiers. And that's just the least of what could happen to them. Um, one of the problems, I think, in the mili with, the, with the military engagements in Iraq and Afghanistan from the beginning, and this relates to women as well, is the complete lack of knowledge of the culture that we were going into. I mean, in Iraq, 50% of the students were women before the war. 40% of the working force was women. Women were in politics. They were engineers. They were lawyers. They were professors. They were doctors. They were not under the veil and locked up at home the way they are in some other countries. But this isn't, wasn't generally known. So. Um, Another problem with the engagement teams is that there hasn't been enough research about the lives of women in Afghanistan so that the women soldiers who are being sent in or Marines are not properly informed about how to behave and not offend, are not properly informed about how to help. One example I read of is they went into a village and they saw that the women had to walk for an hour to get to, to the well. So they dug a well right there in the village. The women destroyed it because that hour walk and back was the only time they could get away from home and the only time they could talk to each other without being watched. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't understand these things, and the information is there. It's not as if there haven't been books written about women in Afghanistan and Iraq. It's not as if the information hasn't been around for a long time. Um, so I think one way that women can help in the military is to raise intelligence and education levels within the military to actually help um, with engagement that is about peacemaking instead of war making. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, for those of you who are not familiar with Security Council Resolution 1325, that's one of the main aspects of the resolution and that should be developed in the US National Action Plan is actually consultations with, with women and women's organizations. And, Perhaps you found that in your work as well. Yes, and actually, I, I think it is OK if we disagree, <laughs> right? I mean, I think yeah. that's the, the beauty of this, is that um, clearly from inside the military, this is one of our own critiques, is that um, we don't all prepare to work in any culture at any given time. And so we're a tool, a foreign policy tool, but we're not sophisticated we couldn't possibly have the level of sophistication that it requires to work in every single culture. So the people who are the best in those scenarios are the people who have spent only, you know, most of their time in those cultures. So we are, you know, we're a tool. When we're called to serve in a certain location, 
We do. Mm -hmm. And so that's the unfortunate thing that we're there, but we, uh, we have to learn on the, on the run, so to speak, and so we're, we're implementing tools, which is why for us the lessons learned are really important. Mm -hmm. Understanding what has been successful, which is what I love about this, is that for any decision maker or any person who's in the uh, analysis or planning process, you can start to contemplate some of the realities like this working in Colombia, we saw, um, from my experience, women, again, were included in the government. Women were in um, the military in small numbers, but it was still a lesson learned for the Colombians themselves that after a period of time in a really harsh environment, younger women were then turned to joining the FARC or the, the paramilitary organizations, and it wasn't something that we had predicted, so it was an evolving scenario, and women were watching it and, and women saw this is something new and then the whole government started to speak about it. So to me, that's, that was a bright spot that we got to observe that uh, DDR programs, the disarmament and reintegration programs specific to those young ladies came about much more quickly because there were people who understood that this was different. Yeah. You know, women saw that this yeah. is different. Yeah. I think, I think it's really important to resist the impulse to imply or infer that, um, that, that, that estrogen is magic juice, mm -hmm. right. you know, and that just because there's two X chromosomes, <coughs> everybody's going to be fine and everybody's going to be peaceful, because that has never been our experience in, in any setting, and it certainly also doesn't mean that the Y chromosome automatically sends somebody off to pick up a weapon. But what we do know is that in every single place on earth, well, with a handful of very tiny exceptions, women get assigned the job of taking care of the sick and giving the new life and taking care of the dead and educating and housing and clothing and feeding and all of these things, right? And that embeds them in communities in ways that are really important. That gives them access to intelligence, not in the military sense, but intelligence about the community. And if you go into the community in a listening posture, which is not how we went into Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and which, which it is unreasonable to expect any military to be able to do. Um, but if we are focused on women, we're forced into a listening posture that probably is slower, maybe more time consuming, maybe more expensive, but in the long run will give us deeper and better intelligence about what it is that that community needs. And above that, you know, we're never going to import peace anywhere. It's just simply not going to be some kind of magic thing that we sprinkle over any community. What we need to understand is the best we can offer is, is assistance to what, you know, peaceful solutions are going to bubble up from inside of communities. And you see in the Afghan film that contrary to what we've been led to believe, there are really effective really bright women who are central and and important and listened to and you know we you know need to um maybe tamp down a little of the sort of the passive and benign prejudice that we kind of come into a lot of cultures in where we're kind of not expecting to find anything and therefore don't find anything because we're not looking for it um and maybe try a little harder to locate the women you know, who can help us mm -hmm. and understand who are the corrupt people, who are the people that aren't worth pursuing peace with, where are the weapons, because women often know, and, and so forth. So, so the, 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 the altering of our posture to one more of listening, um, I think is, is the radical paradigm shift that we tend to tend toward when we hear from women and listen to them and put them more central into, mm -hmm. the, into the peace talks. One, one last um, quick question for the panelists before we go to the audience for questions, which is we have talked a lot about women, the, the film is about women, we're talking about women's roles, but what about the men in advancing this agenda to include women and to talk about women, peace, and security? Mm -hmm. Where do they fit in? Well, I, I would just say, yay. <laughs> one, two, three, I love you guys here. Thank you for being here, um, because it's a little ridiculous to presume that just because we're talking about women, only women should care. Um, 
partly because what we're talking about is how to build better peace. Yeah. Um, but you know, we, we asked Matt Damon to be one of our narrators and specifically on the sexual violence hour precisely because it's counterintuitive um, and precisely because I've spent a lot of years you know, in this movement hearing the voices of women indignant and angry about the way women are treated and I don't hear enough of a man's voice raised in that way. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure what inhibits men from feeling that indignation that it just comes from empathy, really. Um, but I really wanted Matt's voice in there as a way of kind of making it safe for men to maybe step off of their traditional um, posture where this really has nothing to do with them and maybe a a asking what it is that they can contribute to this. But, but above that, you know, I, we show Pray the Devil Back to Hell in all boys' schools, actually, relatively often, and it is incredibly well received. So this perception that they don't care is, is really off. But above that, there invariably is this one question about where the good men are in the film. And I just think it's such an interesting question because you watch that trailer, there are good men all over the place. The question is, why didn't you see them? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that we're expecting from men that makes them invisible when they don't act like Rambo? What is it that makes us not invest any weight in the role of a man who chooses instead to carry out the injured and take care and negotiate and so forth. So um, I, I really think that it's, um, I'm hopeful that this kind of film, which takes you out of your comfort zone and asks you to look at an old thing that you thought you knew in a very new way, in the hopes that it will cause disorientation and will create an environment in which maybe we can kind of reorder some of these expectations we have. So I'm going to move to audience questions now. Um, just a few uh, ground <coughs> rules. I'd like you to know that there's a couple of mics on this side of the room and on this side of the room. So if you have a question, please use the mic. And um, please identify yourself when you ask a question. And second of all, please make ask a question, don't make speeches, and make sure that your question ends in a question mark. Okay. <laughs> so um, I guess we'll take the first question over here. Hi, my name is Lisa King. I was a mid-career student last year and I'm here as a fellow at the Carr Center this year. And first I want to thank you for doing this series. It's amazing. I'm inspired and I want to email and Facebook everybody and tell them to tune in. Do that, please. <laughs> And tweet too. Take out your phones and tweet. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, definitely. And and you said you have a Facebook presence, yeah. so promoting that for you, I guess. But um, <laughs> so on that note, this is a perfect example of using media as a tool for social advocacy, for policy change, for pushing the river, for helping to educate the public. Um, what would you like to see happen with this, sort of in in the short term and in the long term, on with that in mind? Right with education curriculum? You know, you know, I think um, a lot of the expectation around documentary filmmaking um, and social change is that it be didactic. And um, didactic is what we virulently avoided here. We didn't, we didn't want to lecture you or list a lot of statistics or, you know, or, or be all in your front brain. We want this to happen all at the lizard brain part. <laughs> which, is, which is what happens when you're in a room and it's dark and you see a story and you really relate to people and you kind of lose who you are. Um, and so it's, it's really difficult to take a very story-driven, character-driven film and then say, okay, write your congressman, pass this law, give your money to this place. I really don't want to reduce it to that, even though I, actually I'm being pressured enormously from all sides to do that. I think that... Um, one of the characters in Pray the Devil Back to Hell says this amazing thing about how peace is a process. It's not an event. We are going to have to build this peace. And it is an extraordinary thing that in this country the word peace is almost a dirty word. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny. It's kind of not got a constituency. It's not a word you win elections with or sell products with. I think I would like to, first of all, pick that word up out of the dust, clean it off a little, and make it shiny again. And then I want the word peace building not to get underlined by my word processing program anymore. I'd really like it to be a genuine word and a legitimate thing that you do. You choose every day to get out of bed and understand yourself as a peace builder. Because if we can shift in this country the notion around peace as being, in fact, 
the finest thing we can do, we shift the world for everybody. Take the next question over here. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Dominic Contreras. I'm an intern with the Belfer Center, and I'll be beginning an uh, uh, internship with the Consortium on Gender Security and Human Rights this Friday. So I just want to thank you all for uh, coming out and speaking with us today. It's very informative, and I look forward to watching your film. Uh, in your uh, opening remarks, uh, you said that uh, two statistics basically brought about this question is that 50% uh, of conflicts uh, fail, or uh, post-conflict resolutions fail, and uh, you also said we should learn from history. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on the uh, role that um, women played in two uh, things that are considered successful conflict resolutions, uh, the Northern Irish peace process as well as South, Af uh, South Africa as well, although the uh, latter has not succeeded as much as the former has. And uh, also I was wondering if you could comment on the role that women have played in the resolution of the uh, uh, North-South Sudan conflict, as that has been one of the uh, most, uh, the largest uh, peace agreements <coughs> after 1325 was uh, first passed, and uh, how that was, uh, how people attempted to implement that in the process, and just what role women played in the process. Does anybody else hmm. want that? Anybody That's more than one that? question. Well, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that um, the, the difference between um, peace agreements that succeed, if you take the Northern Irish example, for instance, is, is that they construct a peace. And the Northern Irish agreement was very consciously constructed around the idea that reconciliation was not something that would take three weeks and done. Um, and the South African agreement was one that understood that justice in whatever form, whether it was um, um, retributory or whether it was uh, reconciliatory, that, this, that justice was important, it mattered to everyone, and people needed to understand and know what happened. So that this idea that everybody um, should get together and give each other a blanket impunity for something they'd done to everybody outside of the room was, was simply only going to exacerbate the problem in that things really had to be confronted head on. So in each of those cases, you had in the, in, in the room a consciousness that there, after we leave this room, the fact that nobody's picked up a weapon within six months is not a sign of our success. We need to be actively pursuing and constructing elements which will contribute to peace down the road. And uh, th so the South African example isn't going to be applicable in Nepal, and Nepal won't be applicable in Guatemala. Each of these agreements is going to have to take on the character of the place it comes from. But that's precisely why you need the people who are most deeply embedded in communities to be there constructing those agreements. And that's why the importance of women. Yeah. And actually, you know, there, there are so many things that we could look at also. I mean, I think your, your comment about building a definition behind peace building mm -hmm. is, is applicable in places where there was a large conflict. If you look at Vietnam, there was peace building there. It's, it's not what we would term it, but there was a whole process and everybody had to participate. And it may take 10 or 20 years, but I think if we started digging through some of these other places that were part of the 50 uh, ongoing conflicts you mentioned today, look back into some of these other lesser identifiable identifiable uh, conflict pieces, you know, not there wasn't a, a peace agreement like we're talking about now, you could probably see some of these same things. It's applicable in lots of places. But, but just to add, you, you started off the question about the role of women. Um, I mean, I don't know if you would agree with this, but it, it occurs to me that how much women play a role in the peace process mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the role of women in the society at all and how much they'll get to be listened to. So we all know that women were really important in the Irish one. But in Iraq, for example, right now, even though there's um, a mandate, a legal mandate for a, very, you know, for a very high percentage of women to be in parliament, in actuality, only two or three are right now because the men aren't really allowing them to. This is, so this goes back to the role of men, the yeah. question before. I mean, there has to be an openness there that's happening as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we'll take a question over here. Then. Um, I'd like to add my thank yous to Abby and the whole team, because I think at least what I've seen from this and from Pray the Devil Back to Hell, you provide inspiring stories of women really acting to change their worlds and their lives and their family security and their own safety. Um, I'm wondering, um, you mentioned the whole, well, before I say that, there is a wonderful book 
that has just come out, Mighty Be Our Powers, um, which is about one of the protagonists in Pray the Devil Back to Hell in Liberia. And it goes into enormous, beautiful, profound, painful detail about this woman's life and what she did with other women in Liberia. And I recommend it to everyone because it is an inspiring story that in part talks about the role of men yeah. in these processes. Um, but Abby, you talked about listening and the importance of listening. And yet you also talked about what was happening in the places you've been in with these engagement teams. You spoke about the challenges of those engagement teams and what they mean on the ground or can mean to women's lives. How do you reconcile that? Yeah. What does that mean? How do we proceed with any kind of integrity if we know that that is going to happen to women who have been engaged by these teams? Well, again, it's about understanding the local context and, and working slowly and having the patience and, and wisdom to understand that there's not going to be a single answer to any of these questions, and certainly no single answer that will apply to more than one context. Um, but, but I do sometimes think we overplay, um, for instance, men's resistance to facilitating or working with women in these contexts. And I do think to some extent that's a question of the international community sharing a little bit of the prejudice, you know, I, I'm, I'm, which is not to say that I think there are bad people in the international community, but I think there's a, a tiny little of benign prejudice that's very <coughs> quiet and understated. And so when a man pushes back on me, an Afghan man, and says, I won't work with a woman, we're not as quick as we should be to say, well, I'm going to have to insist that you do. In fact, I'm not writing this check until you do. And we, no one in the international community has really insisted and made money contingent on the meaningful cooperation of women. And, and I'm struck by a scene in the Afghan film where um, in, the, in the peace jirga, so the women arrive at the peace jirga, they have 20%. It's not great, but it's better than what they were going to get. They're going to try and make that work as well as possible. We're in a meeting, one of the subcommittee meetings of the peace jirga, and there are four women sitting at the end of the room and a bunch of men sitting there like, you know, what are we doing having to sit with these women? And the leader of the committee stands up and says, look, this is the deal. These women are here. Deal with it. They're your sisters, your mothers, your daughters. They're here. Deal with it. And basically, the room says, well, oh, OK. It's not negotiable. We'll move forward. I, I do think that the international community needs to push back on its own submerged re resistance to these ideas um, and, and make more money contingent on insisting that women be involved in a meaningful way. The next question, please. My name is Safiya Mohammed, Afro Somalia. I'm also the founder of Somali Women United for Peace. And let me say thank you, all of you, giving us this opportunity. As a Somali conflict it grows from local, regional to international, a small political elite, both men and women, are forming different regions of the country. And, but those small groups do not have the support of the public. As a Somali women for peace, grassroots movement grows. And we don't get a lot of support from the international, including the United States. So and how can we get the support we need to make the change? Because in the eyes of the West, we are two Muslim, and in the eyes of the some of the Muslim we are too Western, so how can that come? I, you know, I don't know the answer to that question, except that I, I hope that these films, you know, it's one of my hopes and ambitions for these films, that um, movements like yours look and feel more legitimate to powers like ours, because it's an extraordinary amount of talk about 1325. But then when the money gets handed out, it's extraordinary to me how few groups like yours get funded. The Afghan Women's Network in our Afghan film barely can make payroll most of the time, doesn't really know where the dex check is coming from. Lema Bowie, who runs the Women, Peace, and Security Network Africa, for all the attention she's gotten from Pray the Devil Back to Hell, very often doesn't know if she'll make payroll. She can't seem to get the big funders to really believe in her. So I, I can't say as in the short term I can answer your question, 
but I can say to you, first of all, thank you for your work, and th you have all my respect. Um, and and um, I hope against hope, and it's one of the fundamental presumptions of what I'm trying to accomplish with these films, that, that one of the reverberations will be that movements like yours get much more support in real financial terms in the future. That movie, Bray the Devil, Back to Hell, one of my tools to use to recruit so many women for bees. Thank you. Isn't that great? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take it here. Uh, my name is uh, Charlie Clements. I'm with the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. Uh, first of all, Abby, thank you for making these films. Thank you for getting them onto PBS. And thank all of you for coming here tonight to preview the films and, and, and discuss them uh, with us. Um, uh, I had the privilege earlier today being a fly on the wall when Abby was talking to some students uh, about the, the, some of the technical issues of making the film and why she chose to do it in HD, which is very hard to, to edit, and some of the other issues. I wonder if you could talk about those for the audience as well as some of the challenges, because certainly filming that woman in Kandahar, uh, getting into a car, uh, put both her and some small degree of risk. She was being filmed. Yeah. Uh, there was some interest in her. Also put your camera person in yes. some degree of risk. Uh, and that must have been true throughout this series, yeah. that women coming forward, women are going to be identified you know, as being outspoken, and we know that often gets them in trouble. So could you talk about some of those, those things? Yeah. In fact, Don Steinberg um, at, at USAID calls um, being a woman pacemaker the single most dangerous profession in the world, and I think he may actually be right. Although I will say, I think um, our Columbia women welcomed the attention because it actually made them safer. So it really depends on the context. Um, but we really did a lot of soul searching, with, particularly with Shahida, and we really spent a lot of time talking to her about how willing she was to put herself in this kind of jeopardy. We're very aware of it. Um, she made a very <coughs> conscious decision. She's a grown up and she gets to make this decision with or without our approval that she's willing to take this chance. Um, but you're right, there were incredibly dangerous contexts. And uh, our, our cinematographer came home, and when she sat with the translator looking through some of the B-roll that she was shooting in Kabul, she realized there was a guy standing on the corner with a telephone saying, there's uh, an American woman photographer here, and I'd like you to send somebody over so we can kidnap her now. And she had no idea and didn't realize until she got home and translated the footage. So it was incredibly um, dangerous for our producers and our field people. Um, and I just figure that's kind of the least we can do. I wasn't there, that's easy for me to say. Um, we, we shoot in HD and we hire like the most amazing cinematographer you can imagine and sound people and we go to the trouble of editing in HD and sound and color correction and all of the the bells and whistles that come with the movie Industrial Complex precisely because um, this goes to the question of legitimacy, which is the, you know, that is the barrier for women in these, in these issues, in these, in these conflicts. They're not carrying weapons. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that has currency in a time of conflict. And what we're trying to assert is something so counterintuitive and so against the grain that we feel we need this to be beautiful. This needs to be, these women need to look perfect. They need to look their best. They need to be on screen in a way that's lyrical and attractive and the music needs to work because we're working against such a powerful legitimacy barrier um, that it, it needs to be unassailable. Um, you give anybody any kind of a toehold to attack this and we're sunk. Um, so it's just an understanding of just how deep the, um, the subconscious um, legitimacy barrier is made us really, really reach for the production values and an understanding that they would really go a long way toward making our women more authoritative. Thank you. Take a question over here. Hi, my name is David Brigham. I'm an Army colonel and a National Security Fellow here. I'm going to violate your guidance on ending my, my statement or question with a question mark. And hopefully with an exclamation point, I, I've had the unique privilege and honor of having a female army colonel as my mentor, and I've followed her for the last four assignments be, before 9-11 into Russia, right before 9-11 into Tajikistan, subsequently into, into Afghanistan. I, I talked her into going to Pakistan. Three years later, she's left. 
Colonel Robin Fontes, and uh, no, I don't think any, any, any of these programs without her in it, would, would, to me, it, it's missing. And what, what I have found is it, it's been the, the for, for me personally, it's been the, the most wonderful experience in my, in my life. She is a combat-tested individual who has commanded a, a provincial reconstruction team in Afghanistan. She spent three years in Pakistan working with the Pakistanis, and that, that alone, that's worth about, yeah. I, in Pakistan, it's dog years, so about 21 years over there. And so I, I would just like to just kind of throw her name out there because that, that it's, been a, uh, it's been an honor, a privilege, and, and I think if nobody's writing that name down, somebody should, and the next you know, segment two of this ought, ought to include Colonel Robin Fontes. Thank you very much for everything that you guys are doing. And, and I'll just say that I've met some of the finest women I've ever been lucky enough to meet in the U.S. military. I just, and men. <coughs> and I kind of, frankly, came to all of this with like a uh, peace and thing, not expecting to find that, honestly. And I've been <coughs> just knocked over by the <coughs> caliber of people. They do not want to highlight themselves. There are, there is already a difficult enough challenge in, in overcoming the challenges that are involved in, a, in an overly masculine society. And so please seek yeah. her out. That would be uh, value added. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much for the film. And also thank you for raising the voices of the, uh, the most vulnerable in, in the war. Uh, my question is, while I believe that the African proverb that says, if you raise uh, a son raise a village, but if you, if you raise a, uh, I'm sorry, let me, see, let me say that again. If you, if you raise a, a girl, it says uh, you, raise, uh, you raise a village, but if you raise a son, you, you uh, raise an individual. Uh, sort of, uh, the woman is the foundation of the society. Uh, I just have a question. My question is, uh, through my own childhood, my own narrative, what I saw in the war in Somalia, uh, the, when this war started, women were uh, the drivers of the war. Mm -hmm. And I'll say it because uh, uh, it, is, it, was, it was driven by fear uh, because they were afraid of uh, getting robbed or raped or, you know, the, so they'll tell their man, hey, you really have to go out there and fight. But ultimately, it will come back home because the father will be killed or the son will be killed and they will have to raise the family, they will have to raise the kids and they'll be on their own. Ultimately, they, lo they lose everything. Uh, so it, it goes back to educating mm -hmm. the mothers of the future. Mm -hmm. Therefore, have you guys explore when the, when the, in, in, when the war starts, in my experience at least, they were really the drivers of the war, not because they wanted to, but because of the fear, decision making. It was, it's pretty complicated. And not knowing that it would devour, devour everything. Mm -hmm. the, so this is the aftermath of the war. Have you guys explored you know, what happens when war starts? Well, you know, again, it's diff which war are you talking Somalia. about? Somalia. 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 Yeah. Um, it is um, different in every place that you go to, but it's not unusual for the big voices to be women's voices um, because, as you say, out of fear or um, because they're incredibly invested in um, a system, you know, which they've invested their lives in being perpetuated, you know, because what does that mean about them if that's not a legitimate system? So I don't think it's th all that unusual. Um, but there's also this flip side of it, because those are the voices out front. Um, they tend not to be a majority of voices, and they tend not, often they're the voices of elite women who are invested in political systems, and it's very seldom the voices of grassroots women at the ground level. Um, in, in Serbia, there was this group called the Women in Black, and they went out every Wednesday and protested in the middle of Belgrade, and they had rocks thrown at them and death threats and they were spat on and cursed at and threatened and so forth. And they went out there every Wednesday. They're extraordinary. I mean, in Belgrade, in the midst of that conflict, to be against conflict was an incredibly gutsy thing. But the other thing that they did that I think is incredibly important and 
somebody here needs to go to Belgrade and study this because I don't think it's been really analyzed. Um, they noticed that calls to their domestic violence hotline would spike about two days before a Serbian aggression out into another part of the country, mostly to Eastern Bosnia. And they put together that in, in, in the advance of one of these onslaughts, there was a sort of preparation going on privately in the home. Um, and I'm, I'm just bringing that up as a kind of a <coughs> counterpoint to what you're talking about. There, there are often those women who raise their voices, but there's also this quiet thing happening in the home very often, almost all of the time, around a highly militarized environment where the, the violence and the working up of the aggression doesn't respect the front door of your house. And in fact, actually, um, that tends to be a kind of rehearsal. Um, for what's getting ready to happen. So I think that you need to look past the voices that you hear um, most loudly. Genuinely, generally, the ones that you hear most loudly are the ones that have access to microphones anyway. Um, and also pay attention at the ground level to what's happening quietly and supposedly privately, um, because these private issues of violence are very often actually predictors of highly public versions. Um, did you want to say something? Well, I think that's really interesting because it points out how complex this all is and that, you know, leaders have to be observant and evaluating what's happening before anything happens all the time, of course, men or women, it doesn't matter. But also, you know, one of the uh, issues that you raise is that there was a discussion happening that, that wasn't integrated into larger choices being made. And so if you don't have this inclusive mindset in the decision makers, you could easily suffer, or you know, if there is a lack of decision makers, you could easily suffer something that is this household dynamic or you know, village dynamic or whatever the group is that's having a discussion. And so I think that's you know, UN Security Council Resolution 1325 trying to put out that there is this participation facet to it, a protection facet to it. It's, it's a number of different things that have to be ongoing to keep this a mindset. So we have time for one last question. I'll take the last question. Uh, okay. um, thank you for this this evening. My name is Michael Donnelly. I'm a graduate of the Kennedy School, and I'm a law professor and public policy professor at another institution. My question is starting with uh, the announcement last week from Australia uh, that they will join Israel, Canada, and New Zealand in fully integrating women into combat roles in their military. A two-part question to anyone on the panel. Do you think that's likely to happen for the American military within the next couple of years? And secondly, and I'll sit down to take the response, what's the potential benefit, uh, social, political, diplomatic, of that kind of inclusion for the United States? Actually, I was fortunate enough to hear from the military's perspective this last weekend at the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, our human resource director chief in the, uh, in the Army they, in fact, are relooking all those policies because the environment is so different. And I think we have 70 specialties in the military that women are already working in. I think on the video, it was either Secretary Clinton or uh, Condoleezza Rice. I think one of them said there's no front line. So some of the, de some of the reasons why we made those decisions have evolved into another scenario. They are relooking it. And to me, that's a great example of decision makers, analysts, not stopping with what we have, always seeing what can we do better, what's more appropriate. As a person in the military, I will do whatever the lawmakers say or the commander in chief says. So I, uh, I'm not sure how that'll impact the military, sometimes I think having women out front does give an opportunity to diffuse it. If you have uh, really hardcore women, it might not be <laughs> the same, so I'm not sure I'd yet. like to add to that. Actually, um, in Israel, women are banned from ground combat, so they're not fully integrated. 
Um, but the reality is that women are in ground combat in Iraq and Afghanistan and have been for 10 years now. So uh, when we have this disconnect between what they're actually doing on the ground and what they're officially allowed to do, it ends up in a lot of injustices towards women in the military. They're not, you know, they don't necessarily get the same recognition. They don't always get the, the badge, the combat badges they deserve. Sometimes they're even turned down with the medical issues, medical uh, wounds and so on, because they got them in combat, which they're not officially allowed to be. So you can end up with this catch-22 thing. But I think we've got a military that's changing quite fast. We just ended don't ask, don't tell. So now we, can have, we have a military in which you can be openly gay. It is more in, and even more than that, don't ask, don't tell was an official tool of persecution. So a rapist in the military could tell his victim he could threaten her into silence, or him, a lot of victims are also men, uh, with the threat of getting them kicked out over don't ask, don't tell. And when you give one level of persecution, um, an official stamp, it spreads into other levels, just as we also saw with the, the torture policies under Bush. So we're going to have a military where you can be openly gay now. We're also going to have a military where more and more and more troops are women. Now, it's already happening because of the recession. The numbers of proportionally women have been going up. What this will do in the future, both in terms of numbers and in, I think the combat ban will end. There's already a lot of discussion about it. Um, most of the resistance against it is sounding more archaic by the day, even to the military, because of the reality. Um, I think it will change the face of the American military somewhat. In what direction and how will be seen. But, um, you know, it's interesting. Really interesting. I, I have to say that uh, I'm, uh, the military is interesting because when you're inside of it, I don't think you get how hermetic it is. <coughs> and so whenever I go onto a base, I feel like I've just landed on another planet because <laughs> they're having a conversation with themselves, and then we're out here having this separate conversation. And it's very hard to get. You, do, you know what well, I'm. That's you know the what fact I'm talking why about? we have fellows here, yeah, right? Exactly, <laughs> so exactly. that we can have this conversation but, together. But I've intuited, and I hope that I'm right, that these ten years have really altered the U.S. military in a way um, that that I don't think it can go back from. I think that there is an enormous ground shift in the way that the military not only thinks about questions of don't ask, don't tell, and whether or not women should fight, um, but the nature of of the whole project which is that you know, we are not going to fight the Battle of the Bulge ever again. It's just not going to happen. And <laughs> pretty much from here on out, it's whack-a-mole, right? It's asymmetrical wars and non-state actors and proxy actors and civil conflicts and ethnic conflicts. These are the kind of wars that <clears throat> if you go in with the kind of military might that we go in with, with this extraordinary fighting force that we've invested you know, per capita more than any other place in the world, um, we will maybe win them in the short term, but really, in fact, lose them in the long term. Mm -hmm. Because those are the kinds of conflicts, like Vietnam, like Afghanistan, like Iraq, that you can't walk away from with your hands clean. And so there is an enormous uh, soul searching happening, um, a lot of questioning of what used to be doctrine in the military. And um, I don't know if this is because women have moved in there or because we have faced 10 years unlike any that this military has ever seen. But I have to say, there are some real leaders, extraordinary people, um, who've, who've said things to me like, you know, we're not going to win these asymmetrical conflicts. This is going to be, from here on out, about conflict resolution, about peace building, and the heart and soul of that is women. Um, and I've heard this from people very high ranking in, <coughs> in all arms of the military. So um, whether it's women, um, whether it's just that the ground is shifting, I don't know, but the military is so far ahead of our political culture on this question um, that they're going to need to do some serious work in communication to sell this up the line politically and down the line to the American public because I think they're doing some of the best thinking about this really in the world. And just to um, wrap up our discussion also, I would just like people to be aware, too, that the U.S. National Action Plan on 1325 should be addressing these issues about particip women's participation, not only in peace negotiations, peace processes, but cap right. female capability and peace and security operations. So that's something that we can all 
look towards, you know, towards the end of the year, hopefully, that will be announced and released. So I just want to wrap everything up. I think it's been a really interesting discussion. And thank all of our panelists, and thank our audience for being here. And thank to all of our co-sponsors for this evening. And I want to say a special thank you to Abby for actually doing this film, because I think that something this film series shows us is the way things actually are, and not the way that we would like them to be. And we can feel that women have made tremendous progress in the last 30 years. We have female heads of states. We have the first female head of the IMF. But the truth is that there is no country in the world today in which women enjoy equality. And as a human being, whether you're a man or a woman, this should be simply unacceptable to us. And I think that this film series actually helps us think more deeply about these issues and um, inspires us probably to take more action. So I hope everyone gets a chance to see the film series, which starts Tuesday? Tuesday night, 10 o'clock, PBS, week. for yeah. five consecutive Tuesdays. Yeah. So thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.